real pleasure to be here today, and uh, thank you for, for that introduction. Um, so I changed the title a little bit because of the uh, group that I'm talking to and the content as well uh, to emphasize some of the computational issues that uh, have arisen in, in the course of the, uh, designing the U.S. incentive auction. Uh, but before I get started, I really want to mention the team. I, I stand here and, and I get to proudly tell you about all kinds of things that uh, I did because I was invited to, by the FCC to put together a team to work on this, and my team is an all-star team. I have, uh, uh, in alphabetical order here, uh, Jonathan Levin uh, from Stanford, who's a John Bates Clark medalist, one of the great economists of, of his uh, generation. Uh, Kevin Leighton Brown, who's down here, uh, computer science at the University of British Columbia, who will be responsible for most of what I'm going to tell you about the com computational innovations that we were engaged in. And, and Ilya Segal down here, another colleague of mine at Stanford, who uh, most of the good economic ideas in this project came from Ilya. So, so it's, uh, uh, I get to stand up here in front of you and, and, and tell you about uh, uh, the team, the, uh, what the team produced that we, we put together. And it's just uh, uh, a great honor to be here. And I want to thank you guys for, uh, for making this possible for me. Okay, so uh, what is the incentive auction? So not all of you will know what it is. I've, uh, I want to keep this part brief, but it all began with the National Broadband Plan in March 2010, uh, when the Obama administration uh, put together a plan that said Congress should consider expressly expanding the FCC's authority to enable it to conduct incentive auctions. To my uh, knowledge, this is the first use of the term. Uh, to conduct incentive auctions in which incumbent licensees may relinquish rights and spectrum assignments to other parties or to the FCC. We want to take uh, some spectrum, we want to reallocate spectrum. We want to take it out of its less valuable uses and begin to put it into more valuable uses uh, as, as the demand, especially for wireless broadband, has grown. And then the spectrum, Congress indeed enacted the Spectrum Act in 2012. I've more or less grayed that out. Uh, in, in February of 2012, in October of 2012, we, by the way, our team began work in 2011, before the Spectrum Act, uh, in September of 2011, or in October, I guess, of 2011. And, and the, um, uh, by October of 2012, the FCC had adopted their framework. Uh, they gave a notice of a proposed rulemaking, which was uh, basically uh, written by us that said, here's how we propose to deal with this problem. And then uh, the, there's an appendix to that which uh, provides the details that was literally written by us. And then uh, in uh, May 2014, uh, the FCC completed the regulatory process, had a report and order, and uh, August of this year, the Commission adopted the procedures public notice establishing the bidding procedure for next year's incentive auction, scheduled to begin on March 29th, 2016. Okay, so that's what the incentive auction is. It's an uh, attempt to buy back, um, in this particular case, uh, television broadcast licenses, so television broadcast rights from TV broadcasters in order to uh, reconfigure those rights and, and reallocate that spectrum and make it usable for mobile broadband for the things, you know, for devices like your iPhone or Android and so on. Okay, so the economic problem is quite a complicated one. There's about 2,000 uh, UHF television broadcasters in the United States, uh, counting Canada, which is also going to turn out to be included in this, about 3,000. There are um, uh, currently, we're using channels uh, 13, I think. Is it 13? It's 13 to 51, isn't it? Uh, missing channel 37, which is, uh, channel 37 is, is used uh, for medical devices and, and, uh, and uh, uh, terrestrial, or rather extraterrestrial search. It's uh, radio telescopes and, and, uh, and medical devices. So these, these are the channels that are currently used for television broadcast in the UHF band. As of 2012, 90% of the U.S. Uh, TV viewers uh, viewed their signals using, had cable or satellite service. So what used to be very valuable spectrum for delivering television signals, uh, most people are not getting their television signals over the air anymore. They're getting it through cable or satellite. It's sort of a waste to have all this uh, large quantity of high-value spectrum used for, for television broadcast. So the idea was, um, uh, although there's still 10% that use it, and there's some political issues there, you know, Spanish-language television for people, low-income households, 
and such, so, so the, uh, the issues aren't quite as straightforward as the 90-10 suggest. But the, but the, values, uh, the, the value of, of, of uh, over-the-air broadcast uh, has clearly declined relative to the, uh, the demand for use in mobile broadband. Mobile broadband has been growing very rapidly. Uh, the useful spectrum uh, that was available has mostly been allocated. We need to reallocate spectrum in, these, uh, in the useful bands, uh, the lower frequency bands, to, uh, to, to be able to achieve the continued growth that's anticipated for these services. The plan is, again, to create a transition from lower to higher value use, to provide a cash incentive for broadcasters to relinquish their spectrum, and to cover the costs involved by selling the uh, new licenses are, that are created to mo mostly to mobile broadband providers or to some new entrants that, uh, to Google or whoever else might want to buy the spectrum for whatever reasons that they uh, choose. Okay, now um, the complexity of the problem, at least the way it's formulated today and first pass, here's a TV station somewhere in the Northeast and um, each of these uh, pink stations uh, is a station that cannot be assigned to the same channel as this TV station without causing interference in their broadcasts. So uh, one way to a first order approximation to think about the, the broadcast problem, this is not precise, but it's sort of a first order approximation, is to think of it as being represented by a graph in which each node is a TV station and each arc uh, links two TV stations that can't be assigned to the same channel. There's some other constraints that are relevant as well. These constraints can depend on the channel sometimes. There can be uh, uh, other reasons for constraints, treaty, treaty reasons for constraints. Initially, we had certain stations we weren't allowed to use along the Canadian border because of agreements with Canada and along the Mexican border because of agreements with Mexico. So there was a, a number of, of other kinds of constraints. But this, to a first order, is the, uh, describes the uh, problem. Um, this is one of Kevin's graphs, I think. Um, this is a, I believe this is one of yours, right? This is a, a spring-loaded representation of the, um, of the constraint graph. And as you can see, it's mostly a total mess. The, the spring-loading is, uh, uh, is supposed to identify features. And it does identify some. You see some things that are of some interest here, like you see clicks uh, that, are, th that are all hidden in here as well, where, you know, in the Chicago area, every any two stations in the Chicago area, they all have to have different channels. They, uh, uh, no two, so th that creates clicks in the graph, creates some structure that can be taken advantage of. But particularly in the Northeast and, and throughout much of the, uh, of the United States, uh, we have quite a dense uh, set of connections. The graph is a mess. Okay, um, so I wrote here more than 600,000 constraints. It turns out that in the, when you take account of individual channels, it's two and a half million, I just learned. So the, the, uh, there's two and a half million uh, constraints in this, uh, in this problem that have to be respected. Okay, this is, I um, can't believe I did. In 2011, I signed a contract with the FCC um, to help them design the auction. And the contract specified these goals for the auction design. I still uh, can't believe I signed this thing. But anyway, the, um, the goals, goals for the auction design were efficiency, which meant roughly, you know, maximizing the value of the uh, stations that are left on the air and maximizing the amount of value that's created in the transfer, acceptable revenues, whatever that means, uh, minimize gaming and strategic behavior, uh, avoid windfalls to bidders, feasible to implement in an acceptable time frame, voluntaries, because nobody has to give up their spectrum, something called a group payments constraint, which we wound up ignoring, so we won't talk much about that. Transparent, which means roughly easy to audit and replicate the outcomes, and simple to understand and participate. Okay, um, so that was, uh, that was the objective for this, um, uh, for this auction, uh, for this auction design. Okay, um, challenges, okay, so, uh, there are, so th this is the first time I'm giving this particular version of this talk. You'll see, those of you who have seen this before will have seen a lot of the economic slides, but I wanted to emphasize for this group some of the computational challenges. So I'm gonna, uh, some things are in here that I've never talked about in a public lecture before. So uh, the first one in particular, uh, challenges in the product design. I'll tell you what that means in a little while. Challenges in computing the efficient allocation, 
challenges in computing, victory prices to uh, induce, to create truthful incentives, challenges in even evaluating the feasibility of a set of bids, whether uh, given a set of bids, if we accept those bids, can we find channels, TV channels for the remaining stations whose bids we didn't take um, that are jointly feasible, that don't create uh, excessive interference. Then there were economic challenges. In addition to these computational challenges, can we do all this and make it easy for bidders? It's, um, this is really important. It turns out that the, you know, the, if anybody who knows anything real about auctions knows that the single most important thing in an auction is participation. If you don't get the bidders, you don't have an auction. I mean, you've got to get people in. And the, uh, if we had something that was dauntingly hard for bidders to understand, um, it's a viable option for bidders to say, you know what, I'll transact maybe after the auction with somebody else who sold their state. It's a viable option not to participate. We've got to make bidding easy in order for bidders to participate. And this is a really complicated optimization problem, so how are we going to do that? So that's, that was a serious economic challenge. Discouraging collusion, which is always a problem in auctions. Deciding how many channels to clear. The FCC didn't tell us how many channels to clear. They say, we're trying to get some guys to sell and we'd like some people to buy. How much spectrum should we clear? How do we decide that? Um, avoiding windfalls. Uh, you know, in particular, there's some small stations in New York that have, um, you know, they, they're not very valuable. They cover a relatively small number, uh, uh, a sm relatively small number of viewers, but they interfere with Manhattan just as much as a big station does. And some of, the, some of the big stations are being offered $900 million to, to go off the air. Uh, do we ha also have to offer that amount to a little station to get the state? You know, how do we avoid windfalls for uh, bidders and keep the cost of the whole uh, process reasonable? And then there are other kinds of challenges, diplomatic challenges. The, this, uh, how do we coordinate with Canada and Mexico? That the, basically, the entire population of Canada lives within TV broadcast distance of the U.S. border. And, uh, uh, their stations all interfere with U.S. stations, and, uh, and some coordination is necessary. Mexican border, well, Mexico City is further away, but there's still a lot of interference uh, along the Mexican border. And Mexico, it turns out, even has in its constitution a, a limitation. There have to be uh, a certain number of television channels. It turns out this was an anti-Carlos Slim thing. They, they were worried about the... Uh, um, the um, uh, their politics, their communications being monopolized by the richest man in the world, or I don't know if he's richest this year, but some years the richest man in the world, and, and uh, so they actually have a constitutional restriction against cooperating on this. And so we have diplomatic challenges, measurement challenges, how do we tell whether stations interfere, political challenges, which we won't even go into today. Um, there's, a, you know, there were a lot of different kinds of challenges. I'm going to emphasize the computational and economic challenges today. Okay, uh, the first challenge I want to talk about is product design. And um, what the FCC is actually going to do is it's going to buy the right to turn off broadcasters using UHF TV channels or to get them to switch out of the UHF band into a VHF band or something, but basically to turn off stations that are in the uh, uh, UHF band. Broadcasters who, whose rights are not purchased are protected. No other uh, TV station can interfere with... Uh, very much of that station's uh, covered population. So one of the things the FCC had to decide was what very much meant, and they decided, you know, that it's a tradition in this industry that you round everything to whole percentages, and therefore, um, uh, it's considered that if we interfere with less than 0.5% of a station's viewers, we're not interfering, okay? This is... Uh, uh, the well estate, you know, the, the, you don't have to make new law. The uh, regul law and regulations had said you're not interfering if you have, uh, you know, if, if in whole numbers of percents you're not interfering. Everything was measured in whole numbers of percents, so that's the regulation. Um, now, it turns out that when we were designing this auction, and so this again is something I've never discussed in a public audience before, the, we were looking at alternatives. Um, so uh, we, we looked at an alternative that said, look, you know, uh, you could be a station and we could move you to a new channel and you could take a half percent interference from Kevin and a half percent interference from Ilya and a half percent interference from, from Joe and, and, and you add it all up and maybe you're taking, you know, quite a bit of interference. Maybe we should try to express the interference in terms of the sum 
of uh, all the interference you take. But I remember Ilya pointing out most of the time the interference came from the same direction, and if we drew a Venn diagram, we would discover that, you know, it was the same population that was being interfered with by, by different television stations, so we would need to take all that into account. Anyway, the, the, the measurement in computational complexity made us decide to uh, not do this. That is to say, instead of measuring, uh, uh, so, so this was measurement in computational complexity affecting the products that are being uh, bought and sold in the auction. We had, uh, we had considered um, offsets to say, you know what, we're taking some stations off the air, so maybe Kevin's station over here is taking some extra interference from Ilya, but it's no longer taking interference from Chris. Um, you know, maybe we should get credit for that. That's not creating extra interference. So we talked about doing offsets. That all got thrown out the window. Again, its measurement and computation was, was affecting the details of how this auction had to be designed. And we talked about uh, trying, so it, it, could, it could very well turn out that when we're all done, there are some places where there, uh, there's a TV station that we wouldn't have had, we would not have had to buy that station if, uh, uh, it, it, if we could have said, gee, would you accept 96% of your, uh, only 4% uh, um, interference, and uh, we'll pay you to accept a small reduction from 99%, which we're entitled to, to have anyway down to 96%. We might have been able to get away with paying a smaller sum of money uh, to buy fractional amounts of interference, provided we could keep track of all that during the course of the auction. Again, it was computation that uh, made that impossible. So this, uh, this auction design, the products that were offered, the fact that we're buying stations and taking them off the air rather than buying fractions of the station, this is deeply affected by our understanding of what we could compute, what we could measure, and what we could compute. Okay, so again, uh, just in terms of challenges that come from computational complexity. Um, challenges in computing uh, optimal allocation. So there were experiments be even before we were hired by a, an operations research team that were using mixed integer program um, formulations. And they were uh, trying, they, they spent a lot of time on the formulations, trying to make their formulations compact. And they ran them on uh, CPLEX and on Groby. And they ran them for weeks on the, um, uh, on whatever machines they were using. And uh, they turned it off after about two weeks when it appeared that in the second week they weren't getting much further improvement in the computations and looked at what they had and they were able to prove that they were getting 97% of the optimal value. They thought that was pretty good. Um, they could use uh, that kind of computation, they thought, to, uh, to run an auction. Um, and they wanted to run a Vickery. So the initial proposal before we, before we joined this project was to run a Vickery auction, that is to compute, um, I think you guys all know the Vickery price formula. The, if, if S denotes a collection, I don't wonder how I got a third L in there, of TV stations, and if S in F means that the collection is feasible, that there's a, there exists a, an acceptable channel assignment for stations S, uh, then the Vickery price for a station that goes off the air is the difference between uh, two maximum values. Okay, it's you solve two optimization problems, you take the difference. The problem with this is that with 2,000 stations, a 1% error in, in one of these optimizations would res if the other optimization were exact, would lead to a 2,000% pricing error on average for the uh, Vickery auction. Remember, each station has a value that's about a 20th of a percent of the total value, and we're calculating as a difference of two total values. So if you're making a 1% computation error in one of those total values, that's a 2,000% uh, computation error for a Vickery price, about. It's way too big, and in fact, uh, uh, one of the things Ilya noticed immediately when he was looking at the, at the list of Vickery prices that came out is that some of them were negative, that they, um, you know, they were getting total nonsense, and uh, it just isn't viable. So we, we couldn't calculate Vickery prices. Okay, so again, computational limits affecting the auction design. Um, and then, then there was the question of what, what you say to the bidders. Suppose I could do this. Suppose we, suppose we could uh, get to the point where we got really high, you know, accuracy in the computation, and, and, uh, and I go to Tim over there, and well, Tim may be too sophisticated for this, but I, well, let's, Tim, Tim, Mr. Bitter, I say to you, um, 
you know, trust me, it's in your interest to tell me what your station is worth. I'm going to do this computation. There's no prayer that you're going to understand what I'm doing or that you'll be able to replicate it. But at the end, I'm going to name a price. And, that, and you cannot do better than to report truthfully. And I'm the government. Trust me. You know, um, it just doesn't fly. We're not going to get, you know, even if there are some people who would go, who do trust the government, certainly we can't get all, these are mostly small businessmen. We're not going to get all these TV station owners to just trust us in a calculation. This is a really complicated calculation. So what are we going to do? We have a computation problem, and we have to make it easy for the bidders to participate. And we will, by the way, make it easy for the bidders to participate, as you'll see in a little while. OK, victory rules aren't, just aren't acceptable for this. OK, so um, then there was the question, the challenge of finding feasibility. So suppose we have just one set of bids, and we want to know, can we accept this set of bids? Is it possible? to, uh, given a set of bids, to take those stations off the air and to find channels for the other stations. Well, that's a graph coloring problem, and I don't have to tell you guys, that's an NP-complete class of problems. The, um, uh, when we ran the best current, we're, we're going to try to run this, probably we'll have a, about a minute per problem during the course of the auction. We don't know. We're still, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But let's say we have a minute per problem during the course of the auction. Um, you know, the, the median run times uh, on all the solvers that were available on these problems, we, we ran some simulations, generated the kinds of problems we thought might come up in the auction. We couldn't find any solver that had median run times of less than five minutes. And by the way, median, that, the median means 50% of the problems are, I don't know, you know, I can't tell whether I can accept those bids. And every time you can't tell whether you can accept a bid, that means, you know, this collection of bids, it means you can't accept this collection of bids because you need to be sure when you accept a collection of bids, that it's actually feasible to assign uh, 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 TV channels to the remaining stations. So uh, that would drastically increase the cost of running the auction. Uh, every time out, every time we, we say uh, we couldn't solve that problem, that, that's a big cost increase for us. Okay, so the goal was to get this down to uh, something like 99% in a minute or less, um, the, uh, and more or less that's been accomplished. Um, something, uh, something on that order. Okay, so what kinds of questions do, do I want to talk about that were posed for the consultants? What can the FCC do about the graph coloring challenge? Uh, and this number is only around 20,000 now. Huh? I was estimating it was around 200,000 when I wrote this, but Kevin tells me it's only around 20,000 problems to solve during the auction only. Uh, what, what will we do when, the, uh, uh, when, the, when a computation times out? What's going to happen in the auction? Uh, can the FCC actually make it easy for broadcasters to bid effectively? Uh, can we create a strategy-proof auction that doesn't involve optimization? Is that even useful if the bidder neither understands the computation nor trusts us to do it correctly? Okay. Um, how should the auction identify winners when optimization and even sometimes feasibility checking may fail? Uh, how many channels should we try to clear? Uh, how should the FCC try to accommodate broadcasters who might want to share a channel? So here's something that was a big problem for us in the last year. The, the, um, the technology is such that the, these 6 megahertz channels, which are there for historic reasons because it used to be what you needed to carry a standard definition analog signal, they can carry sometimes two high definition signals. Um, uh, at least 1080i signals. They, can, uh, they know they've su successfully sustained in, in, um, in multiplexing. And that means, you know, we could, we could have uh, these two guys over here. They could decide they're going to uh, sell one of their uh, broadcast channels and share the other one and accept uh, the $100 million or whatever we're offering for a channel and both stay on the air, you know, sharing a single channel. So we want to encourage people to do that. But as the bidders try to do that, they start talking to each other. Guess what? You can't make these agreements without talking to each other. And now we have a problem that, you know, some network, let's say ION Network, some network that has stations in Los Angeles and Chicago and New York, he wants to talk to Fox in, in Los Angeles and he wants to talk to CBS in New York and whatever. So you have some bidder that's talking to all the other bidders. The risks of collusion are enormous in this kind of setting. How do we get? How do we let these guys talk to each other without um, uh, without colluding? What kind of rules can we make? So, actually, that if, if this were a talk to economists, I'd spend more time on that. But for this uh, 
for this group, that's going to get short shrift. And here is the kind of University of Chicago Economics Department question. Um, why, why don't we just leave it to the market? Um, that is, why don't we just say, you know, you guys, uh, you, own your, you own your spectrum, sell it to whoever you want. You know, so the, uh, um, if I have some time, I will, uh, I will talk about that. But I think you guys uh, probably don't need convincing that this is not something that a bunch of bilateral trades can work out without uh, some kind of central organization to clear the spectrum. Okay. So let's take these questions in some kind of order. What can we do about the graph coloring challenge? So this is largely, uh, largely the work that Kevin and his team did at the University of British Columbia. Um, so I'm going to talk about four of the strategies that they adopted. One of them was uh, machine learning uh, to train a uh, parameterized uh, uh, SAT solver, a heuristic, to run fast for a set of instances that were generated by simulations. Um, and uh, I remember the, the, we first became aware of how much you guys had to contribute when we saw the performance of the machine learning on class, which took its average runtime, its median runtime down from something over five minutes down to a seventh of a second, as I recall, in fairly short order, and that was uh, totally amazing. That wasn't all improvements to class. I remember that was partly problem loading and a number of other things, but still it was uh, uh, just amazing improvements. A second strategy is, uh, which I know Kevin is famous for, is, is creating portfolios of algorithms. The idea is that if you have uh, two algorithms for these NP complete problems, if you can arrange that, let's say the runtimes were statistically independent, and one of them solved 80% of the problems in a minute, and the other one also solved 80% of the problems in a minute, if you take whichever one answers first, you have 96% of the problems, only 4% are failing in a minute if you could get uh, uh, in statistically independent runtimes. Well, what you really need is that the set of problems on which they fail within the available time are mostly disjoint, and, uh, and uh, the, the team is still working on uh, ways to uh, what families of algorithms have these properties so they can be used together to uh, drastically reduce uh, runtimes. Third, uh, third strategy was pre-identifying unconstrained stations. So the, the idea is that even though this interference graph is very complex, maybe there's, you know, maybe Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's always possible to find a, a channel for a station in Tulsa, Oklahoma, no matter what you're doing everywhere else. And uh, if you can identify cities like that, you can just remove them from the graph. And if you're lucky, you disconnect the graph into components and, and make the problems easier and uh, make pieces of the problem reusable. And then the uh, fourth strategy that I'll mention here was uh, the building a searchable cache of problem components and no solutions for them. These were, if, if you uh, uh, can generate problems that, uh, that recur uh, and that you can look up the solutions very fast, uh, well, you can look up the solutions, that's very fast when you can do it. It turns out that there, are, there was some really clever work done here. The, um, it's not just problems that you've encountered before that, um, uh, that are useful to put in your cache. It turns out that if, if you know that, uh, that you can't pack uh, stations A, B, and C, let's say, uh, you, you can't find uh, channels for all of stations A, B, and C, and you've already got a solution that has A, B, and D in it, and somebody asks, can you pack C as well? Well, that's a superset of... Uh, uh, ABC, which you had before, and, and you know that if you can't pack a station, you can't pack any superset of that station. So when you search the uh, database, if you can identify supersets, you can also uh, uh, eliminate those or say that those are infeasible. And similarly, if, if you have a sta set of stations that you know you can pack, then you know you can pack any subset as well. Um, you can find channels for any subset, and, and that also uh, speeds the uh, 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 speeds the calculation. You can, you can search the database for supersets and subsets of those two kinds of problems. So uh, these things together uh, uh, led to drastic improvements. The FCC is very, they're, they're happier with it than we are. We, we keep trying to do better um, because we understand how much money is at stake in these, in these auctions. The, the each percent, well, we think that there are still hundreds of millions of dollars at play and possibly even billions of dollars at play in, in the auction from uh, just small improvements in feasibility checking. Uh, the FCC thinks we did great and we should stop bothering them with improvements. So the, um, uh, but anyway, this is, this is what's going on. Okay, 
Um, can we make it easy for broadcasters to bid effectively? Okay, so this is a really complex auction. The, what the chairman originally wanted to do when we went in says, okay, we don't need a Vickery auction. We're just going to have an auction. Everybody says a price, and we somehow or another figure out what the cheapest way is to clear spectrum. We try to minimize as best we can, and then we pay the bidders uh, their prices they named. Okay. Can you imagine bidding in an auction like that? I mean, just think about how hard that is. You know, you're, you're in there, and you don't know what everybody else is bidding, and you have no idea if, if you're trying. I've advised bidders in a lot of auctions, and one of the things we do is mock auctions. We go through what would happen in various scenarios. Well, we can't even compute what's going to happen in scenarios here. This is really hard for bidders. I expect that if we had we done that, and I convinced, I remember being there convincing the chairman of the FCC that this was really a dumb idea, there would be a lot of broadcasters who would say, I don't know what to do. Um, no, I'm not going to bid in an auction like that. And, uh, you know, if the stations are worth a lot, I'll transact after the auction. That'd be a disaster for us. We, we need it to be easy to bid in this auction. And that's a, um, a requirement. And, but is it even useful? Can we make this strategy proof so that it's very easy to bid? And is that even useful if the bidder doesn't understand the computations and doesn't trust the FCC to do them correctly? So, um, the challenge, so this is the challenge about making it easy to bid. And um, what we wanted at the time when we set this up, we said for single-minded bidders, for a bidder who either is either going to keep his station or sell it, um, and isn't looking at any of these other options, it should be a dominant strategy to bid straightforwardly. Um, but moreover, we said it should be easy. The bidder should find that dominance to be clear, even if they don't understand how the prices are computed, and even if they're not so sure that the FCC understands either. Okay? That's the, uh, the kind of constraint on mechanism design we were looking for. And uh, the solution that we came up with is the descending clock auction format. And here's roughly how it works for you. So you are a bidder, and you're participating in an auction, and your station is worth $8 million to you. You're, uh, and the, um, the FCC invites you to an auction, and it says the opening price in the auction for your station is going to be $45 million. And you say, hmm, that sounds pretty interesting. My station's worth eight. How does this auction work? And you say, well, we're going to offer you $45 million, and we're going to see how many offers we get. And if we have more offers than we need, then we're going to start reducing the prices. So instead of offering you $45 million in the next round, we're going to offer you $42 million. And uh, if when I offer you $45 million or at any point in the auction, when I offer you $42 million, if you say no, then you're out. You keep your station, and that's fine. And if you say yes, then you're in, you might get $42 million, or I might reduce the price and give you another offer. Now, there you are, and you're sitting there, Joe, you're sitting there, and I've, you're, you've got this $8 million station, I've made this $42 million offer to you. You have no idea where I came up with $42 million, and you don't know, you think it's, I, I tell you the next number is going to be 39, you say, that's not fair, it should be something else, you don't know what the next offer is going to be, but you know damn well that you're going to say yes to $42 million because your station's only worth $8 million to you. You don't have to know how I calculated these prices, and you don't, you don't even have to believe that I understood how to calculate the prices. You know that the right answer to an offer of $42 million is yes. And, uh, that's, and that's as simple as it gets, right? So this is, uh, this is the idea. And um, the bidder finds it optimal to bid truthfully regardless of how the prices are computed or how the FCC decides whether or not it wants to buy your station at those prices. So uh, I have a graduate student on the market this year, Sheng Wu Li, that has actually this description has benefited a little bit from uh, Sheng Wu's comments. Uh, he's, uh, he's defined this as a new formal concept, uh, the concept of obviously strategy-proof mechanisms. And so this is a, a new concept in game theory. And his, his definition is that at any information set during the course of the, uh, of the game, the best payoff that you can get from any deviation is no better than the worst continuation payoff from playing truthfully to the end. And... Um, that's it. So this is to make it obvious at any, you know, so you're playing in, in this auction, and the best that can happen if you say no is you get zero. And the worst that can happen if you say yes is you get zero. It can't be. It's just obvious that it's not in your interest to deviate. And Chengwu has done a, um, uh, uh, an analysis of these mechanisms, what you can implement, uh, um, 
what uh, some beautiful equivalences, which I won't have time to tell you about, but the uh, the thing you need to know is that it, it, Vick reactions don't have this property. They're not obviously strategy proof. Um, it's not the case that uh, the sending auctions to buy have this property, and uh, that this property also implies something else that we cared about, namely that this mechanism is group strategy proof, that it, and Vickery auctions in general are not. Um, what it means to be group strategy proof is that there isn't any group of bidders that can make a joint deviation that strictly benefits all of them. And why is that the case? Well, during the course of this auction, there's going to be some guy who's first to deviate, and when you deviate for the first time, since this is an obviously strategy-proof mechanism, there's nothing that can happen that can make it in your interest to deviate. The, the best thing that can happen when you deviate is no better than the worst thing that happens when you don't deviate. So for the first guy, it can't be optimal to deviate, so there can't be any group of uh, agents who can uh, have a profitable, strictly profitable joint deviation. Okay, and other things. Okay, uh, discouraging collusion. Um, so I've already said a little bit of this. The, the uh, what am I doing on time here? The um, kinds of collusion, economists recognize different kinds of collusion. One I've just talked about is joint deviations in the auction. Another, what people usually think about is deviations with side payments. That is, I make a deal with you. I make a deal with Ilya over there, and I say, Ilya, you know, you bid in a certain way. I realize it's not in your interest, but I'll pay you something. I'll write you a check, and, and, uh, uh, and you can do something that's beneficial to me, and, and it'll be worth your while to make this deviation. That's a deviation with side payments, and the, um, th those are deterred mostly by antitrust and, and, by, uh, and by the law, by basically by criminal penalties. When, if you have a deviation with side payments, you try to write somebody a check, there's a paper trail. Or, you're, or you show up somewhere with a box full of cash, the, that's a harder kind of, that, that's easier to detect and sort of harder to arrange than a joint deviation in which two CEOs whisper to one another, you know, why don't we both bid, you know, uh, twice as much and see if we can get a higher price. And uh, these joint deviations are deterred by the auction rules. And these kind of deviations we can only hope will be deterred by, uh, uh, by criminal enforcement so that we can avoid those kinds of collusion. There, we also have problems with uh, cross-market collusion and market power issues. Some of these, um, some of the bidders are not individual station owners. They're, they're networks that own stations in many cities. And here the, 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 key, the economists will recognize that the key trick here is that stations in different cities are complements, not substitutes in this auction. And therefore, uh, the, what we worry about when we worry about collusion is that if you have a bunch of uh, stations that are substitutes, that, the, um, that what, uh, what some of the sellers will do is they'll, with, they'll withhold supply in order to drive up the price. When they're complements, you don't have that, uh, that trick available to you. So we're, we're much less worried about collusion uh, by or, or about joint uh, strategies about networks that own stations in many cities because it's much harder to manipulate an auction when the things you're selling are complements. Okay, um, and I've already described to you about the uh, why descending clock auction is group strategy proof, so let me push on. Um, how many channels should the FCC try to clear? Okay, so now here's something we you know we don't know what the the TV st which TV stations are willing to participate. We don't know how much Verizon and AT and T and T Mobile and whoever Dish are, are willing to pay. How many channels should we clear? Okay, so so. That's, a, um, uh, that's an issue that the FCC had to work out. So what we suggested to them, uh, and what they will do in fact, is that uh, there's, a, there's a point at which we, that they set, first of all, really high uh, uh, opening prices for the, uh, for the stations that say, here's where we're going to start the clock auction at some really high prices. And then we have them register. And they register, and on March 29th, they commit to, uh, once they're, they register, we check that they're eligible, we you go through all the legal steps. And on March 29th, the registered stations say, okay, uh, here's what we commit to at the opening price. We either commit or we don't commit to sell our station at the opening price. And actually, they have more options than that, but let's just keep things simple and say that they, uh, we, we announce the final opening prices. They say yes or no. 
on March 29th. And then we do uh, an optimization and we take a couple of weeks and we say, well, given all these stations, if we could buy any of them that we want, what's the most n largest number of channels we could clear across the United States with very little, interf very little interference? And so we do that. And uh, we imagine that what's going on in the, in the background, and this is a simplified example as if spectrum were uniform, which it isn't, and I'll show you the real algorithm in a moment. But uh, uh, this is the way economists sort of like to think about it. You have uh, quantity along the horizontal axis and price on the vertical axis, and just imagine that these were homogeneous uh, products for a moment, and I'll give you the, the real stuff in a, uh, afterwards. So we set uh, some ambitious quantity that's based on the registration. These are people who've said they're willing to sell at the opening prices. This is how much we can sell. And then we run a reverse auction and we let the price fall, and a forward auction and we let the price, uh, it, it, and determine what we'll have to pay for spectrum uh, um, uh, to the sellers. And then we run a forward auction, ascending price, and see well, this is what we're going to uh, receive from the buyers. And oops, that's not good. Uh, we're paying uh, more than we're getting. We're suffering a loss. So this target isn't achievable. So what we're going to do is we're going to re reduce the quantity target. And then we're going to let the price continue to fall in the reverse auction and continue to rise in the forward auction. But oops, that's still not good enough. So we're going to reduce the quantity uh, target again. Remember, we don't get to see these supply and demand curves, but they go and, and oops, oh yeah, OK. Now um, the price that we're getting for Spectrum in the forward auction is higher than the price that we're paying in the reverse auction. And the, um, uh, so these auctions stop and then continue. And, uh, and not only that, we've also raised enough money to meet our, meet our revenue targets, which the FCC sets. And I won't go into the, how the revenue target is set. Um, and uh, that's how we determine the quantity. It's, this, is the, uh, this is the algorithm, the actual algorithm. It's the, it's the same idea. We have prices with different prices for different stations. I'll be showing you that in a little while. But we have prices falling in the reverse auction. We set an initial clearing target. We have maximum opening bids and minimum opening bids, prices falling in the reverse auction, rising in the forward auction, checking the closing rule. If yes, we're done. If no, uh, we reduce the uh, clearing target and we iterate. Okay, and that's the, uh, now we're doing this without uniform prices, with different prices for each station. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the reverse auction prices in a moment. All right, how should we identify winners when optimization and even some feasibility checking fail? Well, I've already suggested to you that the trick is going to be a clock auction, and I've shown you roughly how that works. Um, so here is something that's a variation of uh, uh, this example is actually uh, uh, an older algorithm due to DeVries, Schummer, and, and Vora, 2007. And uh, this airline overbooking analogy is um, uh, thank you to Kevin for sharing these slides. Uh, this, these are, this is Kev Kevin's presentation of the algorithm, um, and it looks like this. So uh, the, the idea here is, remember, we already have stations on the air, so it's like we already have passengers on, on an airplane. And um, we've decided to uh, take some stations off the air to have fewer channels. That's like deciding to use a smaller airplane. So we used a smaller airplane, and all of a sudden, all those seats that were down the middle, they disappeared. And uh, these guys don't have seats anymore. OK? So uh, and moreover, we don't have enough seats for everybody. So we start with an offer. The airline substitutes a smaller plane and opens the bidding with an offer of compensation of $1,000. And so uh, we have a bunch of uh, guys who are not on the um, you know, who don't have seats anymore, there's an offer of $1,000. Uh, at $1,000, by the way, the, uh, some of these guys said, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take $1,000. I'll, I'll go off. Uh, I'll give up my seat for $1,000. These are a bunch of people in first class and business class and coach. They said, yeah, for $1,000, I'd give up my seat. And we said, gee, we have more seats than we need. We're not going to offer $1,000. We're only going to offer $800. And in this auction, and then some of these guys say, "Well, you know, at $800, that's not enough." And now uh, enough people have gone back to first class that it's full, but there's still space in uh, business class and economy class. 
and we say, okay, well, we don't have any more space for you guys in first class. You've accepted $800. You've got it. $800 for you. Um, but we're going to continue to lower the price for business class and coach. At that lower price, uh, some more people say, nope, that's not enough. We continue to lower the price. More people go uh, back onto the plane. Business class is now full. So we need these two guys. There's no space for them anymore. So we buy them at $500. And then we um, continue to lower the price, $400. Some of these guys go back, $300. We still have space on the, uh, in coach, $250. Oops, coach is full. Um, we'll pay those guys $250. And uh, there we have an auction that has determined prices for each individual class um, from one single descending clock price. And uh, if these things were New York, LA, and the Midwest, um, then that could indicate how we determine prices for TV stations. Now, the, the, the New York, LA, and the Midwest also doesn't really describe it. We actually are going to be checking feasibility separately for every different station, because they all have different interference constraints. And at every point during the course of this, uh, we'll be checking, let's go back here, uh, is there room for this guy? Is there somewhere, is there some seat I could put him in? Is there some seat I could put in? And here the feasibility checking is easy. Uh, you know, you, you, you're entitled to a coach class seat. Do I have a seat in coach? In the actual auction, what we'll be doing is uh, solving a graph coloring problem or a variation of a graph coloring problem and saying, is there, uh, is there a channel for you? And if there's not a channel for you, then I can't lower your price anymore. I have to, I have to leave you, uh, I, I have to buy your station and I'll pay you the current clock price. Okay, so that was the, that's the algorithm. Now, the first key difference, so this doesn't describe exactly what we're doing. There are, there are several key differences. The first key difference is, is that the flyers, the passengers, or if you will, which are the stations, they're actually considered one at a time during the course of the auction. Prices during the processing are decreased by small increments, and um, a flyer, it, and a flyer is considered infeasible if it can't be shown to be feasible. So, you know, we, we um, won't always be able to solve these problems. They're NP, it's an NP-complete class. So, um, uh, once in a while, we'll, we'll, we'll just get a timeout, and when we get a timeout, we're going to buy that uh, station. This sequential processing avoids overshooting. It means that we never lower the price by too much but it can also lead to unequal prices for passengers in the same cabin. You can imagine that I was lowering those prices for business class passengers one at a time until there were no seats left in business class, and then depending on whether you came early in the processing or later in the processing, you could have gotten a slightly different price. So those are the, that's the drawback. I think it's not much of a drawback, so um, uh, that's how we do that. Second, um, the order of stations matters. We, we're trying, these are hard problems, and we're going to do a lot of parallel computations, exactly how many remains to be seen. But the, the hardest part for the FCC is checking whether there's a seat available for each passenger. That is, is there any way to assign channels so that I, so that I can take uh, Steve Tadellis over there and, um, and give, him a, uh, give him a channel and also give channels to everybody else who is on the air. See, I made you look up from your PC there, Steve. The, uh, so the, uh, is, is, there any way, is there any way to do that? And uh, so that's the hardest part. And what we're going to do is we're going to have parallel processors running. Ideally, we'll be checking in parallel all of the passengers that don't have seats at, at any given moment. Um, and um, as long as none of them, as, as, as long as all of them are, uh, are willing to accept that price, all these calculations are relevant. But as soon as one of them says, um, uh, as soon as I find one for whom there's not room, um, that some, each time that some passenger rejects its offer, uh, so that passenger now has to go on the plane, now I have to restart the calculations for all the other passengers because I have a new coloring problem. Now, uh, now including Steve on, now that I've added uh, uh, Vince to the, uh, to the plane, now checking whether there's a seat for Steve is a new problem than the one that I was solving before. So, um, uh, so the order of processing is going to turn out to matter. And with limited processing order, the computing power is used best if each, each passenger's bid gets processed when the availability of its seat becomes known. Um, 
the, so, the, so the idea is I'm running this feasibility check, and instead of using a fixed order of processing, if it turns out that uh, I'm processing in the round and I manage to solve Vince's problem first and I say, yep, there's a seat for, for Vince, I can process Vince then. I've had all of my processors are still occupied. And whether the answer to his question is yes or no, I either restart or I don't, but all of my processors continue to run. Whereas if I have a fixed order of processing, which is what the FCC has right now that we're trying to talk them out of, the, uh, if you have a fixed order of processing, then what could happen is it might be that Vince is the next guy to be processed. And I finished checking Ilya and Kevin and everybody else. And I know with, and I have all these processors idle while I run into the one problem that takes me 10 minutes to solve instead of two tenths of a second. And I end up wasting 90%, 95%, la even larger percentages of my processing power with idle processors because I'm processing these stations in the wrong order. So the auction design itself, these tiny changes in the order of processing in the auction design have a huge consequence for uh, how much processing time I can actually devote to each of these problems. And this can, this can make hundreds of millions of dollars of difference in the performance of the auction. It's really, it's totally amazing that the, it's a, these, uh, uh, these computational issues are deeply involved in getting the auction design right. Okay, um, I'm pretty much almost out of time, so let me just quickly say a um, couple of other differences. Uh, as in the example, prices in the, the uh, incentive auction do depend on one single clock that's, uh, that's going down, but unlike the example, um, I'm not going to have the sa I'm not going to be offering the same price to every station. Uh, I'm trying to avoid paying windfalls in the auction, and I have some small station in New York and some big station in New York, and I just don't have to offer the same amount of money to the uh, small station as the big station in order to get it to, uh, you know, to to stay in the air. I know that it's you know it's only serving a tenth as many. Uh, uh, it has only a tenth as many people in its service area, um, so why should I offer it the same price? So I don't. So a station's price depends on its service population. And also, I, I want to have some sense of, if I buy that station, how much it contributes to making the, the graph coloring easier. So I'm also going to count the number of, uh, of um, edges that come out of that, uh, that station. That is the number of interference links. And uh, I'm going to use those two things to uh, determine the price that I offered. Actually, the formula that's used that the FCC adopted is it multiplies the service population by the number of links and takes the square root of that product, and that's the index that it uses to adjust the uh, comparative prices of different stations. Um, okay. And uh, so I'll just say this, uh, deferred acceptance clock auctions, that's the, the mechanism we've been describing to you. They're obviously strategy proof, that as formula, formulated by Lee. They're group strategy proof. Um, they uniquely preserve winners' privacy. So here's another for just for the sake of culture here. There was a famous auction in New Zealand some 20 years ago in which uh, it was a second price auction. The highest bid was a million dollars. The second highest bid was six dollars. Um, those of you who know second price auctions, I didn't get any laughter from this room. The, the, uh, the, uh, that means somebody bid a million dollars and actually only had to pay six dollars. Uh, this made headlines, as you might imagine. We decided we didn't want headlines like that in the uh, uh, in our auction. So uh, we want to. We don't want anybody to know. Uh, they don't want us to know, and we don't want the public to know how low the bidders would have been able would have been willing to go. Nobody ever finds out uh, that, you know, Ilya would have taken five bucks for his station. He was almost bankrupt and that he walked away with 25 million. Um, you know, he doesn't want anybody to know that and we don't want anybody to know that. And this auction, uh, this auction does not reveal that information. Um, and it's the only auction, essentially the only auction that has that property. Uh, this auction requires only heuristics. It doesn't require exact optimization. Um, it can accommodate all kinds of alternative goals and constraints, unlike the Vickery auction. So, for example, we can have a budget constraint. We do have a budget constraint. We, there's a limit on how much we can pay the bidders in the reverse auction. And uh, if, the, uh, it, it, if the auction's too expensive, we reduce the clearing target. We can adjust that. You, you cannot incorporate a budget constraint into a Vickery auction. It doesn't work. So, the, uh, so we have a strategy-proof auction that works even with budget constraints. 
We can accommodate virtual cost objectives. For those of you who know what that means, we can, uh, we can use the, the scoring rules, these different prices, to adjust the prices that are offered to different stations in a way to make this an expected cost minimizing auction. I don't have time to do the detail of that, but it, it's doable. And uh, they also, and this was one of the first questions that the chairman asked me you know, four years ago, or three, three years ago, I guess, that Ilya and I had, had proved back then. You know, so wait a minute, okay, I love these properties of this auction, but isn't this going to be more expensive? If you make it in people's interest to bid truthfully, doesn't that raise costs? And the truth is that we can't really answer that question because we don't know how people are going to bid in a sealed bid auction where they pay as bid. So we do the best we can. So we have sort of this uh, uh, thing that will make everybody shiver. But the, uh, what we did was we calculated the undominated full information Nash equilibrium of the corresponding paid as bid auction. That's all we can do. And it turns out we get a revenue equivalence result, which is to say the cost is the same at, the, uh, at this Nash equilibrium for the dominant strategy mechanism and for the paid as bid mechanism. In other words, there is no reason to think based on equilibrium theory. We have no particular reason to think that this auction has a worse cost performance than the paid as bid auction, the, the, that providing this dominant strategy incentives and even obviously dominant strategy incentives it has a, a net cost to the FCC of zero. And that's pretty much it. This is the, um, this is the FCC webpage for the incentive auctions. March 29th, keep your eyes peeled. This is, uh, uh, you know, this is a historic event, uh, both for the telecommunications industry and for market design. And we were very, uh, very excited about it. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, so the, um, I mean, you know, <laughs> Ilya's smiling here because the, I, uh, uh, I anticipated this and, and the, the, the reason we have such a simple formula, so we, you know, we had, all, we had all kinds of simulations that were run about what the effect of cost would be if we did it in various ways. And um, I knew, you know, if you start putting in, you know, that you're going to take the population and based on simulations, you're going to raise it to the power of 0.63 and, you know, you're gonna, people are going to start arguing about that. So, so we put together um, this formula that we multiplied these two things together and to the power one half. And we said, look, you know, here's what you say, and this is what they do say. And the, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the, the this is this is sensible. It actually works pretty well in the simulations, and it's sensible. And the we have stations uh, that have said that. It, it makes sense to them that they should be paid in part based on their population. And having these two things multiplied together and, and with the power of one half means if you have some station that has, t causes twice as much interference and has twice the population, you offer it twice the price. Okay, the, uh, it has this, you know, just common sense attributes. And so the, uh, um, getting, the um, getting the formula right so that it was uh, something that, that's common sense that's based on, we, we also cite um, some literature which indicates that using square roots of the number of, of, of edges is, uh, is helpful in, in, in other heuristics uh, as being, so, so that's helpful. Uh, it has this, this fairness uh, property that I've just described to you. And, and, uh, and then we just hunkered down and, and, uh, and took criticism from people who thought, especially if you were a small station owner, you didn't like this at all. Uh, the, the small station owners made a political appeal where they wanted a lower exponent on the uh, on population so that they got a larger fraction of what the what the big stations got, um, and the FCC said no. Yeah. Oh, you mean if, if, the, if the TV stations were... So Congress only authorizes the FCC to do this once, okay? So that's in the current legislation. Um, of course, if it's successful, you know, you, but the, the, other, the other problem that the station owners have is, the, is that the legislation does not say that they actually own these rights. They're allowed to sell them in this auction, 
But the rights could expire. They could have lesser rights in a future auction. Um, but, but you're right that in, in, in what we always, we always do this small world stuff when we do modeling. We say, you know, here's the problem, here's your incentives in this context. If you set it in a larger context and give people more choices, it won't, it won't necessarily, in the larger context, be obviously strategy proof. In fact, it won't be uh, obviously strategy proof in the larger context. But it's just marketed as a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's being marketed as a once in a lifetime opportunity, absolutely. And people are treating it that way. Uh, these price, the prices that we quoted, if you've seen the prices out, I mean, anybody who follows this industry, it's headlines every day. You know, we, if you, every day headlines, you know, $900 million opening price, whatever, the, the, uh, the industry is, is all a buzz. The uh, networks that the FCC thought would never participate in this auction because they're the most valuable, Fox, CBS, you know, ABC, they're all saying, gee, we're going to offer uh, stations in this auction. I mean, these, these prices have drawn everybody out of the woodwork. The, uh, and we'll see, the auction will determine the final prices, but the FCC has, has set high enough opening prices to really encourage participation. Politically. No, it's so, so, Congress, so Congress said, um, so this, it's actually changed over time. The, the uh, Congress said that the FCC's auctions had to cover the cost of of relocating stations, which they, uh, Congress set to be $1.75 billion, plus the cost of, um, uh, of the public safety uh, uh, communication system. But it turns out that the previous auction covered the cost of the public safety communication system. So that piece is now zero. So the, uh, the net revenue target is now pretty low. It's just, you know, $1.75 billion, plus the cost of running the auction, you know. Two billion, two, you know, two billion something. It's, it's, it's. Uh, 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 this, these, uh, this auction. The pundits have numbers in the range. It depends who you talk to, but the numbers that you hear are numbers in the range of forty to eighty billion dollars in, in this. It's a big deal. It's a huge auction, um, uh, and and two billion dollars they think of as almost de minimis in that context. It's So that's a that that there, there are political differences about that. The the um, you know the commissioners differ in how they it, it's up to the commissioners. It's their political appointees. Um, they differ in the weight that they place on revenue and on clearing a lot of spectrum. I think the Obama administration is very committed to clearing. They they made a commitment to try to clear 500 megahertz of spectrum in various bands to make it available for for the what they call this the infrastructure of the 21st century. It says in one of the OMB reports, and they're very committed to clearing a lot of spectrum. I think the Republicans put a greater weight on, um, relative to the Democrats anyway, on, on uh, uh, you know, deficit reduction, and uh, um, and think that it's important to make a, you know a, a nice chunk of money off of this. And so those, th but the weight between those two things that's above my pay grade. That's uh, that's a political decision. So that, that excellent question, and I think that's the, the auditability, that's the hardest part to audit. Um, and uh, the FCC is worried about that now, but the hardest part to audit is, the, um, is uh, replicating the feasibility checks. We do know that uh, the stations that we find to be feasible are feasible, because we, we do have independent checks to verify that the solutions that are delivered are actual solutions. But the uh, the timeout and the stations that are infeasible, presumably you can you can double check that the timeouts, and and uh, that's hard to replicate. Well, we've gotten a lot of what we want, or what we're do what we're struggling with right now is is um, uh, is the efficient use of process. We think that the, it could be up to a factor of a hundred in terms of the amount of processing time that could be wasted, and we think there could be a fair amount of money in, in, engaged in that. You know, we're not, we're you know involved in that. We're not really uh, uh, you know, we're running simulations now to try to get an estimate of how having uh, 
effectively longer timeouts affects the, uh, the net cost of the auction. Um, we got most of what we thought was right in this design within the time frame that we had. I, you know, I, you, you saw that there were some compromises we made. Some of the compromises we made, we would need years more to see whether we had any hope of doing. Things that we could do within, with months more are, are things like uh, getting better use of the parallel processing, which, uh, and we'll see how important that is as a result of simulations. Um, so the, the, the software that will be used for the auction itself is all new, and it's, um, uh, and it's being really thoroughly, in the, in the <laughs> subsequent to Obamacare, the government is, the amount of testing is mind-boggling. It's ridiculous, actually. The, uh, uh, the, the interfaces are great they, uh, for the auction itself. The hardest software problems associated with the auction are all the traditional systems that are involved. You know, just doing the registrations, all the old stuff that should be straightforward. That's the stuff that the uh, that we're more likely to choke on. The new software is uh, the FCC has spent the money to do it well, and um, and and they're really excellent interfaces, and I'm expecting those to work uh, beautifully. Okay, we'll take two more <coughs> No, so the, the um, stations that are similarly situated uh, will never differ by more than one increment. It could be that in the, or, in the order of processing, during, so during a round, we're going to, there's human rounds, what we, what we call human, internally within the team, we refer to human rounds and machine rounds. And the human rounds are, you know, we say that your price uh, uh, in the next round may go down by 5%. Um, if it does, are you still willing to accept that price? And then during the processing, we could have two similar stations, and it's possible that one of them has its price go down and the other one doesn't because of the order of process, because of the order within the machine round. Um, and, uh, but that's the, the largest difference that can emerge is whatever the increment is for the, uh, the, uh, the human round. That's the, 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 the difference can, can never be any larger than that if the stations are identically situated. If they're differently situated, there are some stations that we don't need to buy and other stations that we do need to buy. And uh, of course, those will get, generate different prices. Start what? The yeah. Where did they come from? Yeah. So, so we wanted them to be high, and uh, and we took a look at. Um, so you know, it's this is partly finger in the wind stuff, but we took a look at, uh, you know, based on what the prices were in the recent AWS three auction. You know, how we we have our internal guesses as to how much these licenses might be worth. What's the most revenue that we could hope to generate from the forward auction? That's the most we'll ever be able to pay in the reverse auction. And uh, so it's a calculation of that sort where we looked at, you know, what's the most we could ever possibly pay if we gave all of the revenues from the auction to the uh, stations and then raise that a little bit because some of the prices are going to be bid down. And uh, um, it, it was a process like that that led to these. Together with, you know, basic, frankly, investment bankers were involved and so on. We, we, uh, we took a look at transactions, what, what prices were people paying for television stations. We wanted these to look so really high. And so there was a, a, a lot of consideration. How much is the most we might actually be able to afford? How much does it take, might it take to really, you know, turn heads and attract interest? And, uh, and then we're going to count on the auction to bring the prices down uh, into a reasonable range, uh, you know, where there's competition for stations. <coughs> 